Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator this evening as we journey through tantalizing Turkey with Rick and two very special guests. We are so glad that you're here joining us, and we hope that you enjoy your tour. So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to your tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Gabe, thank you so much. And it's great to be gathering as we do every night this month from January 9th until January 30th. We are celebrating Europe. And today we're going to a place that's near and dear to my heart. We're going to Turkey. And we've got two wonderful guides joining us from Turkey, waking up at, I don't know, three or four in the morning to join us. And we're <laughs> going to be celebrating the wonders of Turkey together. So thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. We are travel partners today. And I'm going to jump right into our PowerPoint here. And, uh, you know, we've been uh, gathering people together for decades uh, until COVID hit. Every January, we'd fly in our guides from Europe and from Turkey. And a couple thousand people would fly in, uh, our tour alums, and we would gather. We'd have five or six parties over a couple of days. Great chance to get together and reacquaint with guides and, and our tour members and uh, compare scrapbooks and, uh, and uh, have a nice time together. And um, also, um, well, back then, we would um, also invite our guides over and we would have all sorts of uh, uh, talks that let everybody get to be introduced to new countries and new travel dreams. And uh, this year we decided to do that in the virtual way. So we're having in spirit the same alumni party, the same test drive a tour guide event, and we're selling a lot of tours. At the same time, we want to remind everybody that this is also designed for people who are just going to go on their own. That's our heritage. We are independent travelers. Our whole philosophy is to, to capitalize on the efficiency and the organize uh, the, the economy of group travel and at the same time maintain the beauty of going on your own. Our guidebooks are designed so you can do our tours without us. And uh, uh, you don't need to tap it this aggressively, but whatever it takes to get the most out of the guidebooks, we're all for that. I love it when people, I find people over there ripping out chapters of the guidebook and out on the streets having a great time on their own. That's the beautiful thing. There's a lot of people that take tours and it's not right for them. They should be doing it on their own. There's a lot of tours, frankly, that are not that rewarding. What we wanna do is have a playful, youthful, well-organized, experiential approach to Europe. And that's what we do with our tours. That's why half of the 25,000 people who have signed up for our tours this year are return customers. They know that our tours are not right for everybody, but they are right for them. I'm so thankful for our guides, for our drivers, and for the people who trust us with their vacation. We've got about 150 guides, most of them Europeans, and we are all thankful we're out of this pandemic and we're looking forward to a good year in 2023 of traveling. So this is our festival that we've been enjoying this month and you can see we're at uh, Sunday the 22nd and it's Turkey. Tomorrow is a very special event. I'm joined by our COO at Rick Steves Europe, Craig Davidson, and we're going to talk about the ethical issues of travel in a warming world. And that means climate change. And that means how can we travel ethically paying for our carbon as we go? This is a very important uh, um, issue for responsible travelers. And uh, we hope you can make it tomorrow night to learn what we've been doing with Craig Davidson's leadership to make our tour program carbon neutral uh, as much as we can. On Tuesday, we'll be going to France, and then it's Ireland, Germany, the Netherlands, Greece, Italy, and then we'll have our grand finale a week from tonight uh, right here. Every uh, one of these events has seats open. It's at the same time, six o'clock in Seattle, and nine o'clock on the East Coast, and three or four in the morning if you happen to be one of our guides joining us from Europe. Remember, we're giving away tours. Last week we gave away a tour, and tomorrow we're drawing a name out of the virtual bucket, and we're going to be giving another tour away. As Gabe mentioned, uh, you will get a, a link uh, so you can just put your name in the list. If you want to get at that right away, you'll find that link in the chat section. And I believe it's ricksteves.com slash giveaway. Uh, but we're uh, excited to be able to spice up this festival with four tours that were given away over the three weeks. And uh, not everybody can be a winner with the giveaway, but everybody can be a winner when they sign up during the festival and use the promo code and get $100 off on any tour you sign up for. 
So we've got 40 different itineraries and we have about 1200 tours scheduled to go this year. And uh, that means about 30,000 people are going to be joining us in Europe. And we're looking right now at the tour at the far east there, Istanbul, circling through Kusadashi. We've got two Turkey tours. One is a week in Istanbul and the other is the best of Turkey through the countryside in nearly two weeks. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And if you look at this itinerary here, we fly into Istanbul and um, Istanbul is one of four cities in Europe worth a week, London, Paris, Rome and Istanbul. And we've got a very popular one week look at Istanbul. But if you're looking for the best of Turkey in 13 days, those little numbers mean how many nights we stay in each of those spots. We start in Istanbul, we head into Asia, we spend a night and a day in the national capital of Ankara, we go into the Cappadocia region and stay in Mustafa Pasha, then we go to Konya, the home of the whirling dervishes, we go down for the little bit of a Mediterranean resort in Antalya, we go to the amazing uh, natural formations at Pumakale and the wonderful, wonderful ancient Greek site of Aphrodisias, and we finish with a finale at Kusadashi and the great ancient city of Ephesus. To understand all of this, I really would like to introduce our guides for the evening. And we've got Yaren and Lali coming to us from Istanbul. Lali and Yaren, thank you for joining us. Merhaba. Merhaba to you too. And just seeing your faces makes me want to go to Turkey. It fills me with joy. You guys are such um, so passionate about sharing your amazing country and all of its wonders. And I'm glad that both of you are with us. Um, Lolly, first of all, you run the uh, a company with your husband. Can you tell us what that company is and how long we've worked together? Uh, yes, the name of our company is Scenic Roots and Marvels. Simply, we say SRM Travel. And we we had been tour guides with my husband even before we started our company, but uh, then we decided to start a company for one particular reason. The companies that we worked with considered travelers a simple number on the bus. How many packs? on the tour, but that never um, responded to the needs and expectations and interests of the travelers. And they were always being neglected. And we said that, well, there's a niche. We want to relate to the people that we travel with. So we started the SRM travel and Kismet brought us together with you, Dan. And I think it's been, it's been over two decades, approaching three decades of work together now. So we've worked for well over 20 years together. And at first it was just um, you and, and uh, one of our guides. And uh, about how many guides work with you on the Rick Steves tours? In 2023, there will be nine guides all together, including me and my husband, Tom. Nice. And you've been so helpful for us over the over the years as we've written our guidebook to Istanbul and, of course, as we've made our TV shows. And Yaren, you're the guide that Lolly wanted to have on board tonight to join her to share with us about Turkey. How long have you been guiding and how long have you been guiding with Rick Steves? I've been a tour guide for almost 22 years and I've been guiding Rick Steves tours for more than a decade now. Nice. And what do you like about guiding uh, people around uh, your homeland? I'm a people's person and I love my country's history and the culture and I like to share it with the people. So, you know, and I have a passion for traveling as well. So after studying archaeology and art history, I decided to become a tour guide. Mm, and we're glad you're on our bus. Hey, I'm going to now go back to our slides and we're going to just kind of travel together through Turkey. And um, one thing that I'm really happy about is we have a tradition of sending of subsidizing a tour for our guides in the off season. And for several years now, our guides from Rick Steves Europe have uh, who've wanted to have gone to Turkey to take a tour together. And it's just a great opportunity for uh, team building and for them to understand what it's like to be on a tour. It's very important for our guides to have an empathy for the people who are in a new country and a little bit overwhelmed by all the wonder and the newness of it. And Turkey is a great place for that with our guides. So here we have uh, the, the Rick Steves staff one year and the next year going on the Turkey tour in the winter. And I guess I would say from this point of view, uh, Lolly, we do this when not many people are traveling around Turkey, but it works in the winter too, doesn't it? If you're traveling independently. 
That is true. Uh, it's an advantage to be traveling in the winter, less people, and usually the prices are less. So yeah. you get to enjoy the places to yourself. You just want to be sure to uh, anticipate uh, some cold weather because Turkey, much of Turkey is a high plateau. Well, Lali, Lali, you and I have been doing this for a long time. This must be about 20 years ago. And we were so excited to write that Istanbul with your help. We could not have done it without your help. And you've been there with us whenever we need a big project in Turkey. And I'm so thankful for that. And uh, that continues. Uh, here we have uh, uh, a group of people enjoying their Iraqi. And I guess this is a good time where I would like just to let you guys explain what you're drinking and what you're eating. Can you do a little show and tell? Yaren, why don't you start? Okay. Okay. First of all, I'm drinking my Turkish coffee. Nice. Turkish coffee. Yes. Turkish coffee symbolizes friendship and hospitality for us. It's a social drink. We never drink Turkish coffee alone. We always need to have a company. And it's made of fine ground uh, coffee and then cold water and sugar. We add the sugar while we cook it. So you have to specify the amount of sugar when you order it. And this is the only coffee that can help you predict your future. <laughs> because after we, after we drink our coffee, we often put the saucer on top and then just make a wish, close your eyes, make a wish, and then just make a kind of a swirling movement for three times and then turn it upside down again on the saucer. And then after it cools down, one can tell your fortune by just looking at the coffee grounds. Well, I hope we have good fortunes here. And uh, and, uh, and Lolly, what are you eating and drinking tonight? Well, I have um, a traditional drink we call salep. I'm going to tilt the camera so everybody can see the interior of my cup. Oh, yeah. This is our version of hot chocolate but it doesn't have any chocolate at all. It's a milk drink made by the powdered dried bulbs of the wild orchid flower. Wow. And I've these got... are the bulbs. Nice. And we dress the drink with cinnamon. It's an excellent drink for cold winter nights. And uh, I have it's, uh, a meze with me, an appetizer with me. Here it is. These are stuffed mussels, a typical Istanbul delicacy. The recipe have been around for about 2000 years. We eat them cold by putting some lemon on them. So these are what I have for tonight. I remember you taking me uh, out and uh, istigal kadasi, forgive my language, my pronunciation, and that's korkoresh or something like that, the stuffed mussels. Stuffed mussels is media dolma. Me oh, there you go. Media dolma. Yes. Media dolma. Can <laughs> you pronounce it right at the bottom? Media media dolman. All right. Yes, excellent. Good. And this is the beverage I have. Well, I'm drinking Rocky. And I, I looked in my cupboard and I have an Uzo glass and I've got a Rocky glass. Wow. And we, a lot of people know Uzo and they don't know Rocky, and some people know Rocky and they don't know Uzo, but it's essentially the same drink. I think the Rocky is a little bit stronger, but they're both distilled out of grape pulp, and they have that wonderful aniseed or licorice sort of flavor, don't, doesn't it? Yes. Whoa, and um, I'm drinking it straight, but I think uh, the standard thing is to cut it with some water, and I like this because it makes a little cloudiness. In fact, yes. I don't... I don't know if I can do this. I probably can't, but experts can dribble in a little bit and then you have just a, a, a little bit of cloudiness on the top and the rest of it is still clear. Uh, oh, I love it. I just love watching how the water mingles in there. But there we go. So you cut it with about, I think most people go kind of 50-50 and then it's a little more pleasant drink. And Rick, I have a dessert with me, which we call, yes, which we call chicken breast, tavuk gözü in Turkish. It's made of fine shredded boiled chicken breast. It's a milk pudding. It's an ancient recipe, which is more than 2000 years old. Wow. It was a delicacy which was served to the sultans in the Ottoman palaces. Now we've got Delicious. our... We've got our snacks, we've got our drinks. Let's go travel. Thank you for that little introduction. And um, uh, it's just so fun to think of all the, for me to have Americans going to Turkey and to be able to enjoy a modern 
pluralistic, Western-looking um, Muslim country, um, it's, it's very, very important for us to get a little taste of Islam and to go to a, a country that um, for centuries had the capital of the Roman Empire. Uh, and to this day, it's where Asia and Europe meet. Istanbul is a massive city. Lolly, how many people live in Istanbul now? Close to 20 million people. 20 million people. And uh, it's, of course, a, a very popular cruise stop. Um, is the cruise business, I know uh, there was a time when they weren't going there, uh, when there was a, when it wasn't considered um, predictable or safe. What's the situation now for the cruise lines in Istanbul? It's booming. A new cruise port was built in Istanbul. It's very modern and it can accommodate more number of ships. And it's drawing more and more cruise lines to re-establish their routes through Istanbul. That is great. And I just, I've been there several times on a cruise ship and I think it's one of the most beautiful cruise parts because, uh, you know, you got 3000 people on a cruise ship, you step ashore, you're mobbed with tourists, but if you just hike 20 minutes up the hill, you find yourself in a world that has not a hint of the cruise industry and you're surrounded by Istanbul. When we go to Istanbul, we've got to remember it's on the Bosporus, the body of water that separates Europe and Asia. And Yarin, when you look at this bridge, what does that symbolize to you? This is the Bosphorus Bridge, the first Bosphorus Bridge that unites Europe and Asia. Rick, what I love the most about my hometown is this is the only city in the world where you can catch a commuter ferry. And as you sip your coffee, you can see both Europe and Asia at one glance. You can take an so that's amazing. I'm proud of that. You can take an intercontinental voyage uh, after yes. breakfast and be yes. home by lunch. Many Istanbulites change continents that, in well, a day. And um, you've got a new tunnel, don't you, that goes, uh, not new anymore, but a tunnel that takes a lot of commuters from the Asian side, which is a, a big part of Istanbul, over to work in the European side. Yes, there is. There are two tunnels, actually. Ah. Yaren, tell us about this. This is the main drag through the heart of Istanbul. Uh, can you explain the importance of this street and what we might see here? So this is the Istiklal Street. This is one of the main pedestrian streets of Istanbul. Whenever we like to have fun, we go to the Istiklal Street. This is where we do the coffee hopping. There are lots of cafes and beautiful art galleries, bookstores. So anytime you go to the Istiklal Street, you can see thousands of people walking up and down. And you never find yourself alone in the street. So when we have a coffee somewhere, we have... We eat something else in another place. And as we do that, as we walk along, we also do a little bit of shopping. So this is the place to be in Istanbul. This is one of my favorite places. I love what you said. When we want to have fun, we go to Istiklal Street. And I, I find the same thing in, in, when I can go to the street. There's always people out. There's always demonstrations uh, of different things that are for sale or that you can taste. There's wonderful markets and just so much color and so many people. Of course, Istanbul is a great city of mosques, just like you might find a lot of churches farther west. And when we go to Istanbul, there are two mosques we want to get a close look at. We've got the Blue Mosque and we've got the Hagia Sophia. Lali, can you tell us about the Blue Mosque, please? It's a building. It's an imperial mosque from the 17th century. And uh, it is built right across from the Hagia Sophia, the earlier Greek cathedral, and uh, it has got a dome kind of echoing the Hagia Sophia back to it. So these two structures face one another at the very heart of the old town, and they represent two different periods of history. Both are very glamorous, and they also represent the zenith of the civilizations that constructed them, the Ottoman and the Byzantine empires. The blue mosque, so beautiful with those, especially with the blue tiles. And uh, Yaren, if, uh, if a tourist who's a woman wants to go to a mosque, uh, what does she need to do to have the right etiquette to be polite? The, the right etiquette is to cover your hair. We often cover our shoulders as well. And if we do wear skirts, the skirts need to be just below the knee. And then we all have to remove our shoes before we enter, men and yeah. women. 
and otherwise, um, I felt very welcome going into the mosques um, if, if you're just um, in a worshipful sort of frame of mind and you enjoy the scene. It's, it's a great slice of the culture. As Lolly mentioned, across the way is Hagia Sophia. And this goes back to the six or seven hundreds. And for a long time, that was the biggest dome in the Western world until Brunelleschi built the dome in Florence uh, in 1400s. And we step in here and we see a building that was a church and then it became a mosque. And the fascinating thing is the church faced uh, Jerusalem and the mosque faced Mecca. And instead of moving the whole church, they just slid the prayer niche a little bit to the right. Do I get that right, Yarn, about that prayer niche when it became yes, a mosque? Yes, you are right. You are right. So the mihrab of the mosque is a bit off the center so that when Muslims pray inside, they can face Mecca. Oh, and it's such a beautiful example of a mosque. Uh, that used to be a church. And you've got some of the uh, beautiful art from the Christian period shining through in places that they've peeled away and so on. But it is just one of the richest buildings anywhere. And just down the way, we have the Top Copy Palace. And uh, Lolly, this is um, a great chance to get into the grandeur of the, uh, what, the Ottoman period? Yes, it is. The Top Copy Palace was not only the house of the Ottoman sultans, but also it was the seat of the government. So this was the capital hill of the Ottoman Empire once upon a time. And there are walls around the palace, but it's the walls are symbolic to symbolize the power that is held within, not to separate the interior from the exterior or that they were expecting a threat, but to imply that this is the place. And today it's a museum with several exhibits within. And one of the exhibits is the Imperial Treasury exhibit mm. and has got beautiful jewelry that were made, by, made for the Ottoman Sultans or sent as gifts to the Ottoman Sultans, mm. such as the top cup of dagger we're looking at at the moment you know just talking about all these wonders including the grand bazaar you can imagine it's easy to fill a week with a one-week tour of istanbul and i'm so proud that along with london paris and rome we include istanbul as one of the four cities in europe that we think deserves a one-week tour and i would think for a guide Yaren, it's nice to have a whole week because you have plenty of things to see and do in Istanbul. Uh, what do you, when you think of the week in Istanbul, how does that work for you as a guide? Best of Istanbul tour is one of my favorite tours as a tour guide because it's my hometown and I share my hometown for seven days with our tour members. So we do different kinds of things. We do visit all of the highlights like Hagia Sophia, the Topkapı Palace. But besides the things that we do on the Best of Turkey Tour, we have neighborhood walks. We catch a commuter ferry with our tour members and we go to the Asian side of the city. Mm -hmm. We even take a commuter ferry on the Golden Horn. So it's it's a wonderful tour. And we also visit the archaeological museum, a world class archaeology museum mm -hmm. in Istanbul. So that's amazing. And after the tours are over, our tour members also do can enjoy the city. There are beautiful festivals in the fall in the spring so you know it's full of full of activities and i'm sure included in that is the grand bazaar this is our the grand bazaar yes it's been covered shopping mall from the old days and plenty of opportunities there to get lost in a beautiful way and then another huge market uh closer to the golden horn is the spice market and when we go into the spice market uh yaren you're just overwhelmed by all of the beautiful aromas of all these exotic spices that remind us of the old spice road, right? I mean, tell us about the importance of the spice. That, what is it? What is it called? The spice road, the old caravans arise and so on. Actually, you know, during the Ottoman Empire, Egypt was part of the empire and most of these spices came via Egypt. Hence, we call it the Egyptian Bazaar in Turkish. Okay. And uh, it's located just near the water. That was where the main port of Istanbul was located. Spice Bazaar is a real treat for the senses. And it's a ritual for many Istanbulites to go there and shop for their spices, dried fruits and nuts and Turkish delights. And look at all of the delights yes. that are filled with honey and nuts and, sh and, and so on. And then just stepping out in the street, there's always something going on. You know, you could just, I could be with either of you and just walk for the day. And we could find uh, so many things that were totally serendipity surprises. And uh, uh, like somebody getting married. In the, and uh, then we get on our, um, uh, do we take the, we used to take the train. We take the bus now, don't we, to Ankara, Lali? Yes, we do. 
And uh, tell us about the importance of Ataturk and what we will find in Ankara. Ataturk is our George Washington. He was the founder of Turkish Republic. He is a very important figure for us, not as a politician, but also as a person who lifted the boundaries for Turkish people to go ahead of their age. And he was the person to recognize uh, equal rights for men and women, give women the option to run for office and to, to vote, not only vote, but also run for office. And as a Turkish woman, I believe we owe much to him because if I'm not crawling in a burqa today and if I can get the education as my male friends and study and work have the same opportunities, it's all because of this very visionary man who started all of it in the early 20th century. I am so glad that we've taken a moment to honor Ataturk and to have you explain the importance of Ataturk because I'm inspired by Ataturk. The way I understand it, Turkey was still in the Middle Ages until World War I, and it was, uh, it was called, I think the Ottoman Empire was called the Old Man of Europe. And, uh, and then Ataturk came out as a hero, I guess, of World War I. He saved Turkey from the buffet line of European colonialism, and with great heroics, he established, he really, George Washington, the establishment of modern Turkey and gave Turkey a modern constitution with a separation of mosque and state and, and equality between men and women. And he set a standard that to this day is something that bolsters Turkey against trends that are taking us in different directions. And when we do go to Turkey, we'll find there's a lot of political action going on and Ataturk provides a bedrock for the democracy and the freedoms of Turkey in so many ways. And that's why Turkish people love to go to the mausoleum of Ataturk. And as a tour pro, uh, producer, our tour company, I'm really thankful that we include that in our tour. And um, you guys can uh, help our travelers understand the importance of Ataturk. Lali, what are we looking at here then? It's a three-dimensional model of Ataturk's mausoleum. Our group is around the showcase. This is by the entrance of the mausoleum. So when we visit the mausoleum, we first stop by this plan and explain our travelers what is where. And afterwards, we take them a tour of the mausoleum and the museum, not only to visit a burial, but to honor the man who catapulted Turkey out of the Middle, Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing and thing. And then, and by the way, there's so much more to cover and we have, we're gonna keep it moving along because of our timeline for these events. But I do wanna remind people, we've got an hour and a half of Turkey uh, available uh, that Lolly helped produce on three TV shows. And if you go to ricksteves.com, go into the TV section, look under Turkey, and you'll see in an hour and a half, pretty much the same route that we do on our tours. Uh, Lolly, we pretty much followed the route of our tours to do those shows, didn't we? Yes, true. And you can learn a lot about what, what you might be doing, including uh, the mausoleum of Ataturk. Now we drive for a few hours and we get to the um, exotic uh, heartland, the romantic heartland, the evocative heartland, <laughs> the breathtaking heartland of Anatolia, and that is Cappadocia. And this is the land of the fairy chimneys. And Yaren, we, when we go to this area, we find a, an amazing mix of culture and geology and nature and history. And describe a little bit of what we're looking at here, please. Cappadocia has a unique volcanic landscape thanks to erosion. And what we have in Cappadocia are, we have troglodyte villages, we have underground cities. There's actually a subterranean urban landscape thanks to the underground cities in uh, Cappadocia. And we see rock cut churches decorated with beautiful Byzantine frescoes. And we can climb in there and climb around and pop out at an upper window. And when we it's look- like a, It's like a playground. It is like a playground. And I remember as a tour guide on early tours, I would have some some uh, 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 member of the tour suddenly pop out way up above. And I'd go, how'd you get up there? And get down. I don't want you to fall out of that hole. But it was really quite an adventure. And as a matter of fact, there are even underground cities where you have you could you could drive a, an army right over the ground and not know you've got what six stories of people underneath uh, Kaimakli is one of those they go back centuries and uh, Lolly when you think of an underground city like Kaimakli um, 
tell us how how involved that engineering was in that community. What do you find if you go out of the sunshine and straight down into the earth? These underground cities um, were started to be built around 2000 BC. We think the first civilization that started them was the Hittite civilization. And first they excavated, they carved one level of dwelling under the ground. And as the population increased and as the traffic in Asia Minor increased with armies going back and forth in every direction, people needed more space. So they started leveling the underground cities. You can imagine a tree that is upside down in the ground. So it would have a main shaft, like the trunk of a tree, and then it would branch out from that shaft. That and is a beautiful way to describe it. I've not, I've not been able to conceptualize that because you feel like a, a rat in a warren, you know, or something. But that <laughs> one main corridor branching branches out and yes. ventilation. And uh, it's just it's quite mind blowing to to travel through there. And then also when you go into these um, cave dwellings, not necessarily in the underground cities, but in the, um, the, you know, the caves that we've seen earlier, we find some very interesting art. What are we looking at here, Lolly? We are looking at the frescoes in one of the churches of the Göreme Open Air Museum. These, most of these paintings are from the Middle Byzantine period, and they are the iconography depictions of events from the Bible on the churches. And here we're looking at a fresco of Jesus Christ decorating the dome of one of the churches. Huh. And these are still originals. Wow. Yeah, it's, there's so much to see in Cappadocia and um, the terrain is dramatic like this. And one of our one of my favorite places, sort of the classic, what I would call a back door, is the town of Guzeliort. And Guzeliort is a beautiful town, I think. And when we stand here, we're looking at many layers of civilization. Um, can you just kind of give me a, a tour guide's uh, um, walk through what we're looking at here, Yaren, from the from the bottom to the top, and talk about the different layers of history we're looking at? So Guzayut started its history as a Greek city, and it was um, mainly populated by the Orthodox uh, Greek Orthodox Christians till 1924, when we had the population exchange between Turkey and Greece. And then when most of the Christian inhabitants went to Greece after this population exchange, it became a dominantly Muslim uh, city. So many of the mosques that we see in Guzalia today, they were once churches. So once we go there, when we go there, we generally uh, stop at the beginning of the national park, it's also a national park. And we walk down to the old mosque, which was a former church. And there we meet the imam of the mosque and we have a Q&A session with him. And what I like. I'm going to find the imam. Where's the imam? Yes, the imam, There's the imam. The imam should be. Here. No, OK, yeah. that's the imam. <laughs> And so we get to we visit on the carpet and talk with him. That is such a yes. wonderful experience. We cover our hair, we remove our shoes, and we sit on the carpet and we ask questions to the imam. Sometimes he asks questions to our tour members. So that's a wonderful people's experience. It's kind of a, yeah, it's a back and forth. I remember I've done that several times and he's interested in us and we're interested in him and we just get together, which is one of the most beautiful things. Forget, forgive my uh, rapid fire there. But exploring Guzeliert, we have a chance to just connect with people who don't see a lot of tourists. And yes. I just love sitting on a bench with the guys, you know, having a cup of tea. And so many times I've just had a great time. One of my favorite things to do in Guzeliert is to go to the main square. And Lolly, do you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> ah, yes. I'm going to bring out my favorite souvenir. Well, my favorite souvenir, as I always say, is to take home a broader perspective and uh, empathy for the other 96% of humanity. My second favorite souvenir is my beautiful backgammon board. And this is not one you'd find in a store. This is a, a homemade backgammon board. I can smell turkey here. And it's a beautiful smell. It's the tea. <laughs> it's the laughter. Oh, and that's the, the rattle of the handmade dice. And the white wood is, is uh, uh, softer than the dark wood, and I can feel that. This has so much happiness worn into it. And it reminds me of the people of Turkey. 
any tourist can go to any town and go to a tea house and find themselves in a game of backgammon. Is that realistic, Lolly? It is very realistic. The locals would love a visitor approaching them, wanting to share with them. As we say, if the visitor takes a step towards the locals, they would take 10 steps coming closer to you. And it would be, you are interested in them, they are interested in you. It's our culture uh, that in our culture, we say a guest is sent by God. Yes, that's so, a it's a beautiful we would thing. our best to connect with the visitors. Does not matter where you are in a big city or in a small town. The guests are very important to us because they are sent by God. And you, you know, I hear that 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 uh, folk saying, "A visitor is a gift from God," and it it feels it's embraced by Turks. I mean, we are royally welcomed. And if when it comes to backgammon, learn to play backgammon before you go. If you don't know how to play backgammon or if you're not very good at it, don't worry. You just sit down, they'll set it up. And if you pause, somebody will move for you, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. it's a commotion. And there's an American joining all these new Turkish friends and it is just a lot of fun. You can, anybody can do that, whether they're on their own or during free time with the tour. And with our groups, we just love to go into the marketplace and just connect and, uh, and just, meet people and, and create memories. We stay in a hotel that, that your family actually runs in uh, Mustafa Pasha, right? Tell us about our stay here and what kind of activity we might enjoy after dinner. In Cappadocia, we stay in a very typical house, which is a volcanic masonry with some sections, units carved into caves. So it's a combination of a cave dwelling and a masonry home. And there are many things we do in Cappadocia. One of them is enjoying the local music. We have locals joining us to play the music, but they're not professional musicians. They're just the town's folk who are interested in us and want to entertain with us. That's the beauty of it. So we are not watching or participating in a professional performance, but it's a village gathering that we enjoy all together. You know, Lolly, as you were talking about that, they're not professional musicians. They're just friends of the family and so on. It True. reminded me of my travels in my 20s. And for seven or eight trips in a row, I would go to Europe and just travel around. Um, and I would have a year rail pass. And my I would let my train pass expire in Greece. And then I would finish my trip in Turkey. That was the, the grand finale of my European trips. And then I would have to take the train from Istanbul all the way back to my cheap flight out of Frankfurt or whatever. But, but Turkey was the cherry on top of every European adventure. I didn't plan it that way. It was just something that deep down inside I wanted to do because of the joy and the love of life and the eagerness for people to share their culture and how different Turkey is from the rest of Europe. So it is that way to this very day. And because of the complicated relationship the United States has with Islam and the and our inability or our, our challenges of better understanding uh, you know the Muslim societies all across the planet I really think the most impactful tour that we offer is the Rick Steves Turkey tour it's the one tour that I was sure to take my mom and dad on and all my best friends on and that I've been committed to through thick and thin we have done our turkey tours for um, I would say 30, 30 years, wouldn't you say so, Lolly? Even before I was working with you, and yes, it, I think it's over thirty years. And I have never, ever forgotten the joy of being able to introduce people to Turkey. I mean, you can just see the love. I'm, I'm not, I'm not just uh, getting fancy here. You just see and you feel the joy and the love, and you can taste the food. What are we looking at here, Yaren? We are looking at a beautiful plate of traditional Turkish dishes. We have dried bean dish, which is a staple uh, in Turkey for every household. We often have it once a week. We see a shepherd salad, which is made of small pieces of tomato, cucumber, and then um, sometimes pepper and onion. And then we are looking at a bulgur rice. So in Cappadocia, we visit a very nice lady whose name is Fahriye, and she cooks for us. And this is her home. And Yaren, we're looking at something else there. We're looking at my carpet. I'm, I have oh, a yes. carpet just like that. I just noticed yeah. it. I we love are looking that at, carpet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful carpet, yes. 
I was there, I went uh, uh, with a good friend of mine from Twin Cities Public Television, David Preston there with the, with the colorful hat on. And uh, with our group, uh, I, uh, we, we all bought the, um, went to the market in Urgoop and we all bought these baggy, what we considered like pajama pants, but this is what every, <laughs> it seemed like everybody was wearing. And we would walk around with these, uh, this is our thing, we always wore the local pants on our tour. And then about two days later, uh, we had noticed that we were causing quite a commotion when we'd walk down the back streets with these <laughs> pants on. And, and somebody finally said, Rick, these are women's pants. I don't think <laughs> so I, I guess I learned yeah, that's why they were looking at us. We, we, yeah. We've met the imam. And is this the home of the woman you were talking about there, Yarn? Yes, this is the home of Fahriye. It's the traditional part of our home, and we sit on this divan. Some of us sit on the carpet, and we share food, we share stories, we ask questions to Fahriye. Sometimes oh. she asks questions to us as well. So it's it's one of the nicest things that we do. Oh, it's so nice. And then, if people want to, this is extra. Uh, you can get up very early, and I believe Lolly will drive people to the uh, balloon thing, but it's quite expensive, and most people, a lot of people, don't want to lose half a night's sleep. But you get up while it's still dark and uh, you go and if the weather's right you have an amazing experience and that is a balloon ride oh do you enjoy do you, do you still go on the balloons lolly yourself i personally do yes and we make sure that our tour members have a chance to do it if they want to so it's available for them yeah. it's as long as the winds are blowing at the right speed if there's one place in there's many places that you can ride a balloon these days because it's a it's a cottage industry but it seems to me the classic place to ride a balloon would be cappadocia and i had never done it before and i've done it twice now we filmed on it and it is one of the lifetime experiences and we're very careful with rick steve's europe tours not to get sidetracked by a lot of um, enforced shopping and something that's very important is to recognize that a lot of people want do not want to spend an hour in a carpet shop, but other people want to spend two hours in a carpet shop. So we make up a, a very strict sort of um, parameter here when we have a tour that yes, a lot of people want to shop, but it's not going to be forced on everybody. And those who want to go to the carpet shop, go to the carpet shop. Those who want to leave early can leave early. Those who want to stay to the end can stay to the end. And this is a, a carpet shop where you can take home or have shipped home a wonderful souvenir and they have quite a show even if you're not shopping for a carpet it's just quite an interesting experience um uh, yarn is there anything you want to add about the the carpet shopping experience you know every culture is identified with a handcraft and turkey is identified with weaving thanks to our nomadic past so, you know, when you live in a tent, you cannot have furniture, you need to have some, you know, uh, textiles so that you can easily fold them up and carry them with you. And what I love the most about this experience is to meet these ladies, you know, to see the pride yeah. as they weave their carpets and climbs. That makes me so happy. I got to say, I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got a Moroccan carpet that's out in my garage, just getting moldy. And I've got two Turkish carpets on my floor in my house. And I, I treasure them. They've been there. You know, you pay, you. you got to pay some money for a carpet, but it's a beautiful thing. And it takes me back to Turkish culture. There's so much meaning there. Um, and it's a beautiful investment. So um, it's nice to have a tour company uh, like you guys that can vouch for these and to know that it's a fair price. Then we travel to Konya. And Konya is one of the most religious and conservative places in Turkey. This is the home of the Prophet Mevlana, or a lot of them, a lot of us call him Rumi. And we visit the center of Konya, and we visit a very, very spiritual and important place to the uh, to uh, Muslim people. Uh, Lali, can you explain to us what we find in Konya and the importance of Mevlana? Sure. Mevlana was a mystic philosopher who lived in the 13th century. He emphasized the mystical side of Islam. He did not teach anything different than what the Quran, the holy book says, but he put out certain themes in front of people so that they can understand better. And as a matter of fact, Rick, when you go to the uh, when you go one step 
further or deeper in any religion into their mysticism, you realize that they're almost identical to one another. I often find sayings or teachings of Mevlana very similar to St. Francis of Assisi. Uh -huh. And uh, Mevlana- I was, I was gonna, excuse me, I was gonna ask you about that right now and, and you predicted what I was gonna ask you. To me, the teaching of Mevlana, anybody can embrace that because it's love. It's love, it is. you know, and the teaching of St. Francis, it's love, it's love your neighbor, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, continue. It's the only thing that's going to save you, love. Yeah, it's beautiful. And here we have the tombs of the of, of uh, Mevlana, and most importantly, here we have the whirling dervishes. Uh, this is not a cruise ship entertainment, this is really a form of prayer. This is monks that are whirling themselves into a meditative trance, to meditate on the teaching of Mevlana uh, and to um, be a conduit, I think, of God's love and to how can they live their lives in a way that's true to their God and to Mevlana. Can you explain to me, in, in your understanding, Yaren, when we look at a whirling dervish, not what are we thinking, what's he thinking? The whirling dervishes whirl because they believe that every little particle in the universe whirls. So they do whirl in order to get harmonious with the rest of the uh, universe and to become what with the divine love that is Allah, that is God. So, you know, when, you, when I see them, when I watch them, I see that they are full of composure. You know, they are full of dedication. So it, it's, an, it's a kind of an ethereal experience to see them. Oh, I love it. And I've, I've heard so many interpretations of it, what's going on, and it's just a, the embodiment of the teaching of, Mev, of Mevlana. And for us, with our guides, we look at these cultural things, whether it's how you explain why there are carpets, or who is Mevlana and what's a whirling dervish. On our buses, with our high-minded approach to travel and culture, it's not just a photograph moment. You know, it's not just cheesy entertainment. This is part of the culture, and it may be there in a restaurant uh, so the tourists can see it, and, and he be, we may pay to see it as if it is, uh, you know, a show, but really it's, it's, it's anchored in a beautiful tradition in a rich part of Muslim culture. Then we go down to the coast, and it's time for our little vacation from our vacation, and here we uh, settle into uh, Antalya, and <laughs> Lolly, can you tell us about what we'll find in Antalya? It is fun, fun, and more fun. It's a beautiful coastal town on the Mediterranean. Uh, it's somewhere um, south of Ankara, I can say. And the Antalya has a very picturesque old town that is where we stay for two nights. And uh, there are lots of things our tour members can do in Antalya. For that reason, we do not have a constructed day. We'll leave it to tour members' enjoyment. They can choose to take a boat trip. They can choose to go to the wonderful archaeological museum or walk around the city walls and have a Mediterranean day. Or they can just enjoy the beautiful hmm. orange orchard in the garden of the pension we are staying or have a Turkish bath. So many options are for them. And as we drive to Antalya on the bus, we take our time to explain and prepare our travelers what's ahead so that they can plan and decide what they want to do. Uh, and I'm sure it's a welcome day when it's not structured because most of the tour is quite structured because there's so many important things to see and do. But Antalya is a chance for people to catch up on their shopping, go to the hammam, take a Turkish bath and, and so on. And then the next morning we head further west and we stop at one of my favorite ancient sites anywhere in Europe, Aphrodisias. It's an amazing site. Yaren, what do we see in Aphrodisias? Aphrodisias is an ancient Greek city dedicated to goddess of love and beauty, Aphrodite. And if you lived in the first century AD in Anatolia, it was the place to be. Thanks to its marble quarries and their loyalty to Rome, they enjoyed many privileges. So the entire city is made of out of marble. It's in the uh. middle of nowhere. Just like this, you know, the landscape is amazing. This is the stadium that we see. Although Aphrodisias was a city of maybe no more than 10,000, they built a stadium for 30,000 spectators. So they built to impress. Ah, and this is, I'll never forget that this is our cameraman, Carl, here, and we were filming. Once again, you can see all these sites in our TV show in a 90-minute presentation. And if you're turned on by Turkey, turn on our TV show. Uh, but I'll never forget being here and coming around. You climb up a little bit and you enter the stadium 
and you just go, wow, what a stadium. And it's silent and it's all yours. And then we can have fun running the, the race and so on. As I mentioned, our TV show covers all of this. And when we go to an ancient site, anywhere, any great ancient site, you can bet that there's a archaeologist and a, a team of people that, that guard the treasures. And most of the treasures have been taken out of the air, the modern air, and put into uh, climate controlled and, and a safe uh, museum. And Turkey has wonderful museums on these sites. So I would just say it's really important when you're visiting an ancient site to not miss the indoor part of it. Your ticket always includes the museum and it's worth checking out. Next up is Pamukkale. And Pamukkale is this amazing geological um, terraced set of terraced little ponds. And uh, uh, it's just an otherworldly kind of environment. Lolly, you've been going to Pamukkale for, for decades. It's understandably an important part of any itinerary, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is a UNESCO a heritage site. It is a UNESCO site for uh, its history and for its nature. What we're looking at are the calcified cliffs, the calcium deposits caused by the water running over the terraced uh, hillside of Pamukkale. And the water has thermal qualities. It People in the past knew about this, and that's a reason why an ancient city was established where the thermal springs are. People wanted to benefit the healing properties of it, as we do today. I can never get tired of Pamukkale. There's something magical about Pamukkale. And what's really unique, you've got ancient Greek columns to frolic with in the mineral springs. Yaren, tell us what we're doing here. This is the ancient Roman pool. Uh, so we do different kinds of things in Pamukkale. You can enjoy the ancient city. You can swim in the ancient Roman pool as the, as the Romans did 2000 years ago. You can also walk on the white travertines. Mm -hmm. So this is amazing. So we have ample free time over there so that tour members can do all these uh, different activities. There's quite an ancient site there too, isn't there? Uh, Hierapolis, yes. I think it's called. Yeah. Yes. And then the last stop on our tour, is Kusadashi, and it's famous because it's a cruise port, so many people know it from the cruise ships there, and uh, cruise ships stop here because it's just a half an hour drive from Ephesus, the home of the Ephesians, and uh, one of the most impressive Greek and ancient Roman sites anywhere in the Mediterranean world, but Kusadashi is our final stop, and any number of places in Turkey, of course, you can go to a hammam, and it is I got to say, it's one of the experiences you want to have, uh, man or woman. You just got to go to a hammam. Lolly, what happens when you go to a hammam? Well, it's uh, usually we go to segregated hammams. Men and women go to different sections. There's a changing chamber. You get undressed. And after you get undressed, the attendants will give you big pieces of cloth like your grandmother's tea towel so you can wrap around in it and then walk into the calderium, the hut room, the steam room of the Turkish bath where there's a large marble slab that is heated, under, heated underneath. First, you lay on it and soak yourself in the hot water, wait for a while so that uh, your skin becomes ready for exfoliation. Exfoliation. It, oh, no. <laughs> it is fun. Lots of fun. And uh, then an attendant just, comes. Just make it real uses, bad and do this. Yeah. Uses a glow, silk glow to rub your skin, exfoliates your skin, gets rid of the dead, dead skin and the dirt. And afterwards, wash you with soap, massage you, and wash your hair as well. When it's all done, you wrapped up in dry towels like these gentlemen are doing and relax in the tepidarium, in the semi-hot <laughs> room of the bath before you get dressed and walk out. You know, I'm looking at this photograph and I, I'm, I believe I took this photograph. It's a long time ago. And I just, what's a deja vu for me is this, the, the, the sort of relaxed happiness on the face of these guys. And it was just a beautiful time together. We were going through this decadent experience and I remember when I was a kid, I'd go to the hammam and I was out there backpacking and, and they would exfoliate me and <laughs> they would do this. And I don't want to gross people out, but if you can think of a, a Tootsie Roll, you know, a long Tootsie <laughs> Roll, there, I would have Tootsie Rolls of dead skin that would come off of me. And then when it's done, you've, they've, they've bent you and cracked your back and, and, you, <laughs> and you hang out under the hot waterfall. And then they wrap you and you just feel like a Gumby. You, you just feel so happy and relaxed. 
I love that experience. And then you're ready for the finale of this 13 day look at Turkey. You got Ephesus, the home of the Ephesians. It was a Greek city, but what we're seeing is mostly from the Roman period of that city. Isn't that true? And when you see the grandeur of Ephesus, um, famous, uh, you know, from the Bible and uh, uh, Paul and uh, the, uh, the, the whole drama of this city, you've got to remind yourself, what, only 25% of it is excavated or something like that, Yaren? Only 15% of the site has been excavated, but still it's one of the largest excavated archaeological sites in the world. And it's also famous for its cult of Artemis, who was one of the most powerful goddesses of the ancient Mediterranean. And the temple dedicated to Artemis in, in the city was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Amazing. And this was the facade of a library. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I mean, imagine. I mean, this is 2000 years ago. They had this amazing library. And and then you've got the you got the beautiful theater. Tell us. Yes. Tell us. Tell us the famous what happened here that that's in the Bible. The, the most important thing which took place here was when St. Paul came here and preached about the oneness of God and his teachings uh, were not very welcomed because of the cult of Artemis, because many people in, you know, in the city of Ephesus, they were selling the silver figurines of the goddess. So it was the main source of their income since the temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So, you know, they wanted to expel St. Paul and then there was a huge revolt that took place in this ancient theater. So, so basically you got Paul coming in and he says, yes. yeah, you don't need to worship this, this, yes. uh, this, uh, you know, Artemis. Yes. Our Artemis, this, you don't need to buy these statues. Yes. And everybody who makes the statues for their living goes, hey, you can't say that. And they actually <laughs> ran them out of town, I believe. Yes, Paul stayed here for almost two and a half years, the longest he stayed in any wow. city on his journey. Yeah, well, there's whole whole tours on the footsteps of Paul in Anatolia, and this would have yes. been a major stop. And the acoustics yes. are amazing here. Amazing. There's so much to see. And then some of the houses that have been excavated are really remarkable. And I want to finish here with just a little tour of some food. Lolly, can you just kind of ad lib a description of what we're going to be looking at here, please? Yes, we're looking at appetizers that we call meze, M-E-Z-E, -E, and we start almost every meal with cold appetizers. They're mostly vegetarian dishes, and um, they're served before the main course, and that's what we're looking at. And I would like to say a few words about the Turkish cuisine. Just imagine the land that the Ottoman Empire occupied once upon a time over three continents. So all the best of the produce that is on this land, came to the capital city, came to central parts of the Ottoman Empire. This makes the Turkish cuisine very rich, richer mm -hmm. beyond what is produced in today's Turkey, mm -hmm. because they had ingredients coming from and the chefs yeah. in the palace had a sultan to please. They got all these ingredients and came up with beautiful and very delicious dishes. In Turkey, we have um, what we would call an Anatolian cuisine, that common folk, everyday folk ate what grows in their hometown. And we have an imperial cuisine that is prepared by the ingredients that were shipped from all corners of the empire. Wow. And in our tour, we try to taste a little bit of all. And look at those plates. I got to say, there is a plate I would travel for. That looks like a lifetime memory of a, <laughs> of a meal there. And uh, I think uh, the group probably enjoyed their dinner here. Uh, what do we have here, Yaren? We are seeing a lavash bread. It's a kind of a puffy lavash bread that we enjoy with the mezes and the kebabs. Nice. These are to die for. I and, love them. So are the kebabs. What do we see here? We see, uh, I think, Adana kebab, which is a spicy kebab, which is made of oblong meatballs. We see lamb kebab, chicken wings, and then tomatoes, and then peppers. These mm. are all different kinds of kebabs. You know, you and find we enjoy that with that lavash bread. You find the Turkish uh, food uh, all over Europe because there's a lot of Turkish workers in Europe and they want yeah. their home country food. But there's nothing like going to a nice restaurant. And uh, don't you have some of, is this the dessert you have with you tonight, Yaren? No, this is not the dessert. This is what oh. we call künefe. It's fine shredded filo oh. dough filled with unsalted cheese. It's also ah. very good. We often decorate it with uh, ground pistachios as well. Canepa, it's really that, very good, very that, rich. Was my, 
That was my favorite dessert in really? Palestine. Yeah. When I was in Palestine, Kanafa, everybody would go to uh, one town and they would just have to go there for their Kanafa and we can get it they in get, Tur Turkey yeah. also. Uh, yeah. We've got we've got the bus and we've got the happy tourists and we've got the route. Lolly, can you please walk us through this route just briefly to review what we've done since we started our tour in Istanbul. Give us a quick review of the best 13 days in Turkey. And I want to remind people, you can do this on your own. You could do Istanbul and then you could take the train to Ankara. You could rent a car in Ankara and you could drop the car in Kusadashi. Uh, there's great bus connections all over Turkey. This is very accessible, whether you're going on your own or you're going with a Rick Steves tour. I would just remind you that these tour itineraries have evolved over 20 or 30 years. And we know Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world. And we have really got to use our, our, our time as smartly as our money. Both are very precious and limited resources. And we think this is the best 13 days that Turkey has to offer. If you did it on your own, you'd probably want to take 18 days to do all of this because with a tour bus you can accomplish more without being hectic because everybody is everything's figured out in advance and the bus is right there when you need it but you could certainly do this on your own if you gave it a few more days okay lolly give us a quick review please sure we start our tour in istanbul that is in the european section of today's turkey in istanbul we get familiar with the history of istanbul and what was the ottoman empire and the byzantine empire after a few days in istanbul we head to central turkey where we spent five days between the capital city ankara the magical landscape of cappadocia and Konya, the hometown of the ruling dervishes. And we choose Ankara to start the discovery of central Turkey because as Istanbul gives a start to understanding the history of Asia Minor, the, constant, uh, the history of Ottomans and the Byzantines, Ankara helps us understand modern Turkey. And in Ankara, we visit a magnificent museum called the Anatolian Civilizations Museum that summarizes the history of Asia Minor to us in just two hours. And in Mustafa Pasha in Cappadocia, we enjoy the landscape and the history. And in Konya, we'll learn more about Islam. Then we head to the coastline, to the Mediterranean, to Antalya. Coastline is dotted with Greek and Roman ancient cities. We visit the best of them in Antalya and Kushadas. The Ephesus is the... Mm -hmm. Zenith of all them, between Antalya and Kushadasa, we go through Pamukkale and Aphrodisias, although they are not coastal like the two others, but because of the uh, existence of the marble quarries, people chose to settle in Aphrodisias, and because of the thermal springs, people chose to settle in Pamukkale, and we get to learn why they chose to settle in them and enjoy life as they did once upon a time. And of course, the end of our trip is marked with a magnificent visit to the ancient city of Ephesus. Wow. And thank you for that review. And from the end, people can do most people go to fly home from Izmir or do they go back to Istanbul? Uh, people fly from Izmir to Istanbul, but from Izmir, there are some direct flights to Europe, too. OK, so but you've they got can either or. You've got a good airport in Izmir. You can you could travel around in Turkey or from Kusadashi. Can you go out to Samos still on the boat and be yes, in the Greek you Isles? So it's you an hour and a half of a ferry ride. And Samos is a you know, when I first did our Turkey tours, we would finish in Samos, actually. Did you know that uh, we would include the hotel in Samos and then people would travel on through uh, through Greece. So you could add Greece to the end of your Turkey experience or you could do more of Turkey, or you could just fly home directly. But I'll, as I as you went through that, it occurred to me, I've probably taken this tour eight or 10 times uh, in the last uh, 30 or 35 years, and it never gets old. I just, as I listened to you talking, I was thinking, man, I'd love to do this again. I wanna remind you on a Rick Steves bus tour, all the group sightseeing is included. You pay for it at the original cost. So there's none of this selling you extra optional tours. Uh, you have a small, friendly group of people 
24 to 28 people generally on a tour. I say friendly. What I really mean is uh, we shape our clientele by the way we advertise the tours. So you've got a, a hearty, flexible, curious, fun-loving, young at heart crowd on these tours. And that makes it, I think, a lot of fun. You've got a great Rick Steves guide. You've seen two of them right here, fully paid, which makes it a, a really nice situation. All the tips are included. That means your driver and your guide are fully tipped included in their uh, salary or wage with us. And uh, that means they are on your side with enthusiasm from the start. All group transportation, accommodations in characteristic, memorable, centrally located hotels, all your breakfast, half your dinners, and most importantly, I want to say you again, you've got a wonderful guide and driver and a smart itinerary. I do want to remind you, we've got 65 tours. They're all free on the Rick Steves Audio Europe app. We're working very hard to update all of these uh, tours. There's a tour of Ephesus included in the 65 here. But if you are interested in having self-guided tours anywhere in Europe, be sure to take advantage of the Rick Steves Audio Europe app. It's totally free. And it is the, the self-guided walks that are in our guidebooks and that we like to give our groups when we're traveling. If you go to ricksteves.com, this is a wealth of, of free information. You've got our uh, all of our uh, archive of TV shows, our radio shows, our lectures, our language classes, uh, a, a huge in-depth coverage of our tours. If you want to know more about the different tours, it's a big decision. You'll find all the information there. And of course, you'll find out which tours are still available for 23. Uh, so lots going on there, and you can go to our homepage at ricksteves.com to sign up for your future uh, festival classes coming up uh, every night until the 30th. Want to remind you once again, tomorrow night we're going to draw <laughs> we're going to draw a name out of that virtual bucket, and somebody's going to win a tour. And you'll learn more about that from the email you're going to get tomorrow or on the link that's in the chat section. Any tour you sign up for this month until the 30th, you get $100 off if you use the promo code. And I put, I had my staff put this together just so at a glance, you can see we're about 80% sold out for 2023, but we have scheduled as many tours as we feel we can really uh, not compromise in the quality by adding beyond our, our capacity, but to meet our demand. And a few of the tours are sold out um, and you'll find a lot of the dates are taken, but there's probably 500 departures out of the 1200 that still have seats available. And here you can see there are plenty of departures and plenty of seats available for 2023. And that includes Istanbul and Turkey. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the ethical issue of climate change and travel. I hope you can join us for that. It's a very important topic. And our, C e our COO, Craig Davidson, is passionate about this. He really knows his stuff. And he's put together a portfolio of 10 organizations. And we fund those with a million dollars a year so that all of our travelers, anybody who takes a Rick Steves tour, knows that we have covered their carbon costs. They're flying from here to Europe and back, and we're paying for the carbon through mitigation. And we believe in mitigation. We're doing a lot of good, and that mitigates the carbon we take when we broaden our perspectives through travel. I hope you can check that out tomorrow. And then I'm going to join up with, uh, well, Steve's joining us on Friday, and then we've got Ireland, Germany, Netherlands, Greece, and more Italy coming up. So a lifetime of travel coming your way. And right now, I just want to thank Lolly and Yaren for the amazing uh, hour that we've just been able to share. And you guys are an inspiration. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Rick. Rick. Nice. And Gabe, I bet we have a few questions from our, our wonderful travelers. We have a lot of excellent questions from our travelers tonight. And I'm going to start off with a simple one, and I'll um, ask this one to you, Yaren. Um, Lorraine was saying that recently she has noticed different spellings of the country Turkey. Um, yes. Is are there any changes, and what is what's the correct way to spell and say the country of Turkey? That was a recent change, and the name of the country is changed to Turkey, the land of Turks. In fact, we always called our country Turkey, the land of Turks. Now it's internationally called as Turkey. Turkey. So Turkey is the right name, the right word. Well, I always learn something at these presentations as well. Turkey. I just did too. How do you spell Turkey? Turkey? How do you spell Turkey? T U with dots R K I Y E. Turkey. 
Turkey. Land of um, Turks. <laughs> nice. Land of Turks. Lolly, um, I have a question for you, um, and it comes from Susan. I think that whenever we go somewhere that maybe is culturally even a little bit further than what we were used to, there's always some questions about is it safe? Is it, you know, is it receptive to Americans? What would you say to somebody who was maybe a little uneasy about going to Turkey, just in terms of just general safety? Uh, Turkey is, and Tur Tur Turkey and Turkish people are very receptive of the guests, and they are very welcoming to the Americans. And um, it's particularly important for us and everybody that people from different cultures visit our country and culture so that we can start crossing the gaps cro the, and build bridges between one another. And people on the street realize this very well, and people are welcoming, and Turkey is rather safe to travel along. I remember once um, somebody forgot uh, a bag at a hotel and um, the, they were all, of course, concerned. And the hotelier put it on a bus or postal bus unaccompanied and it went to the next town and it was waiting for them at the next post office or whatever. But there's a Turkey feels like a big family. And I, I know it has an image for a lot of people of being um, unsavory or dangerous, but that's a, a person who has not traveled there. Anybody who's traveled in Turkey, as I have probably for 20 trips, knows what Lolly is saying makes total sense. In fact, if I was Turkish and one of my loved ones was, was going to America, I would have more reason to say, do you think it's really safe to go to America? I mean, think of all the, the shootings they have. You just, you don't have that kind of problem in Turkey. You have a few events occasionally that make the news but Turkey is a, it feels comfortable from an American traveler's point of view. Just leave it at that. Rick, I have a question for you. We had one person who um, was specifically asking about Ergodon, but also we had a question even the other night when we were talking about um, Eastern Europe with people wondering if they should go to Hungary because they don't agree with Viktor Orban. And I mean, you've traveled across decades, and I'm sure there's been points where different countries have leaders and policies you approve of and ones that you don't. How do you navigate that as a traveler, deciding um, mm -hmm. whether or not you should travel to a place if you disagree with their leadership? You know, that's such a good question, and it's a reasonable question, and I've thought about it for 40 years, literally, as I've traveled into places where I'm meeting the enemy, you know, and I have always thought, I don't care who's running that country, I want to go there and I want them to meet me. I don't want them to meet the propaganda their government feeds them about America. I want them to meet me. And that's making a huge thing. And I want to meet them because maybe they're not as bad as our media portrays them, you know. So the people to people is a huge source of peace. You just cannot overstate it. Um, and uh, I just I've never not gone to a country because they have a bad government. Um, I've gone to, I wouldn't go to Russia right now because they have a bad government, but the main reason I wouldn't go there is because I wouldn't feel safe there. Um, I would love to meet Russians and talk to them and let them talk to me. But as far as Turkey goes, I wouldn't give it a, a second thought. I, I just think it's great to go to Turkey. It's, I love to go to places that are out of your comfort zone. A lot of people kind of go, oh, culture shock. You don't want to go there. It's culture shock. I mean, protect, how do I, how do I avoid culture shock? Culture shock is why we travel. It's the growing pains of a broadening perspective. And when you go to Turkey, you have curated culture shock. Can you imagine being spoon-fed culture shock by Yaren or Lolly for 13 days? <laughs> That's my kind of diet, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a great diet to start for your New Year's resolution. Maybe I just need another glass of, of Iraqi, but I like <laughs> that kind of culture shock. Yaren, um, we talked briefly about how Hagia Sophia um, has recently again become a mosque. Um, is it still easy for travelers to visit? Um, and kind of following up on that, I'm curious what your favorite mosque in, in Istanbul is. 
So, um, Hagia Sophia changed its function throughout its history. It was built as a church by Justinian, by the Roman Emperor in 6th century AD, and then with the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople, it was converted into a mosque. And just right after the foundation of the modern Turkish Republic, it was secularized and converted into a museum by the founder of the country, Atatürk. And then very recently, I think only two years ago, it was converted back into a mosque. It's open to visitors, we can still see. Uh, the experience is a bit different, of course. We see it mostly as a mosque, um, but most of the, many of the mosaics, Christian mosaics are still available for the visitors. And about the second question, my favorite mosque in Istanbul is Rustam Pasha Mosque, very near the Spice Bazaar. Mm. Uh, we go there on the Best of Istanbul tour, Although the Blue Mosque is known as the Blue Mosque because of its beautiful blue tiles, for me, the real Blue Mosque is the Rustam Pasha Mosque. It's a small one with only one minaret, with a small dome, but it has the most exquisite Turkish tiles. So when you enter, you feel like you are in Garden of Eden with all those floral patterns, tulips, roses, carnations. So it's a beautiful mosque. And it's it's in the heart of the Spice Bazaar district. So you just walk through the old market to reach there. So it's beautiful. It's a true Istanbul experience. I, I just got to jump in. Gabe, can you imagine having such two well-spoken guides, so smart, as your <laughs> friend for 13 days going around a country that is so misunderstood and mysterious to us? What's I mean, it worth? Working, it's a beautiful getting to work with our guides is oh. is one of my favorite parts of my job. So I um, love it. You guys are amazing, and and you've got six or eight colleagues that are just as good. I I've never, yeah. you know, we used to always have an American go as an escort on a Turkish tour just so everything was okay. We don't need to worry about that with Lolly and her gang. I mean, we are in such good hands with these guides, and. Um, I'm just so thankful that we've got a, a great tour program. And um, I just, um, it's a difficult corner of the world. And, um, you know, you can just, uh, you can just go to, you know, Ireland if you want to, which is great. But if you want to really, you know, get out there and, and get where the action is, Turkey is an amazing experience. Just can't get over it. Speaking of Lale and Lale's tour company, um, there's a question I love. It's from Rebecca Lale. And Rebecca's curious, what is your experience like <clears throat> being a business owner in Turkey? Mm. How does how does Turkey compare to the United States in terms of how capitalist it is? And do you enjoy being a business owner there? Merhaba, Rebecca, and thank you for your question. Um, it is of course, an experience to be a business owner in Turkey. Uh, the, the difficult part I can say is the red tape. There is a lot of bureaucracy involved, a lot of documentation and inspections, rules and regulations that you have to follow. They are kind of the tiring part of my job, part of tiring part of my business. But on the other hand, it has got a very awarding side to it because we are one-to-one -one with our travelers and we get, get their feedback at that very moment when we look at their faces and that's an incredible award and that is just what keeps us going and that's what feeds us so I think I must say that I love what I do and I feel very happy and cherished to be part of the Rick Steves organization as well. Well, we have time for just one last question tonight. Um, and the question comes from Gail. And Gail was curious. It, it seems like in some of the photos and in, in Rick's stories, it sounds like it's primarily men that are playing backgammon out in the streets. Um, do women also play backgammon? Whether um, Turkish women, do they play? Or if, um, if there's uh, a female tourist, is she also welcome to jump in and play a game? Lolly? 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, in the countryside, in small villages, in coffee shops, it's mostly men. And women are welcoming coffee shops to play the backgammon and hopping in the metropolitan areas, which are cosmopolitan and they're open to both men and female. But in the small communities, they are more conservative. Does not mean their fundamentals, it's just their style of life that they communicate uh, that they um socialize with the same sex more than the opposite sex and this carries on to the coffee shops too it might be unusual for a single traveling woman to walk into a coffee shop in countryside turkey to play backgammon but when you are with a group when you are with us we help you the way to do it easily so that you can mix with the people and I think that's a great way to end the time. I think you got to learn how to play. You got to learn how to play backgammon before you go to Turkey. You got to drink some Rocky. But what you'll drink more of is tea, I think. And that's a beautiful chai. It's just a beautiful part of Turkey. There's so, you know, the best thing about travel these days. I mean, let's say, let's say you had a tour company and you're trying to sell tours. What do you do? Do you, do you advertise bucket list things to check off or do you advertise experiences? What we advertise is experiences. We want people who want experiences and we've got experiences to offer. And when you were to measure how many experiences per, per mile, minute and dollar you get in Turkey, it's got to be right up there on the top. It's just a, a rich and powerful experience. And we're just thankful to have guides like Yaren and Lolly. Yaren, Lolly, thank you so much. Gabe, thank you for moderating. And to everybody, thank you for tuning in today. And we are together. We're celebrating travel, and this world's a beautiful place to explore, and we'd love to be part of your adventures. Happy travels. We'll hope to see you soon.